Welcome back. This is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. This year, Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to two American scientists, David Julius and Ardem Papaputian, for their discoveries of skin receptors for temperature and touch. Papaputian was the mentor of Professor Xiao Bailong, a biochemist at Tsinghua University in Beijing and postdoctoral researcher in Papaputian's lab from 2007 to 2012. Xiao witnessed the Nobel-winning research work in Papaputian's lab. He also quickly followed up on his own discovery with related early studies. So what breakthroughs did Papaputian's team discover along the way? How will this research help humans, especially those with serious illness? Professor Xiao Bailong from Tsinghua University shared his insights with me. Take a listen. Now I'm joined by Bai Long Xiao, professor from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Professor Xiao, what a pleasure to see you. Oh, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet you too. I know you are celebrating together with uh, the longtime professor you've been working with. Uh, what about this year? What a nice surprise, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes, great. Yeah, actually, it's very, it was very exciting. Yeah, when I saw the news, I immediately send an email uh, congratulation to my previous supervisor, uh, Dr. Adam Patapudian, to congratulate him for this award. Mm -hmm. What is the significance really of him and also his counterpart winning this year's award? What does that mean in terms of recognition of the field of research? Yeah, I think it's very significant uh, because our ability to sense heat, cold and touch is a very essential for survival and uh, undertaking our interaction with our environment, right? Uh, in our daily life, actually, we may take this sensation uh, in, for granted. For instance, if we would have today's interview in person, the first thing uh, we will do when we meet is to say hello and may shake hands. Mm -hmm. But have you ever given a thought how we feel the hand shaking? Yeah, then we may chat a bit about the weather, right? Mm. Today, I'm in Beijing, so it's getting cooler. How about in Shanghai? Mm. Are you in Shanghai, right? I'm Am in I Beijing. Right? Oh, you're in Beijing too, okay. So, so you, you must agree, today is getting cooler. Absolutely. So, but do you know how we can feel different temperatures, yeah. heat or cold? So, but why do we need to make sense of the senses in a way? You know, for us, it's, you know, we take it for granted, right? We just feel there is coldness, there is warmth, there is, but, but, but why do we need to make sense of it? Uh, by making sense of it, what are we achieving or aspire to achieve? Yeah, so maybe I would answer this question in two ways. As a scientist, we are very curious how this occur. So for this, this question, I think have been solved by this year's Nobel Prize laureate, Professor David Julius and Adam Patipodian. So David actually used a, a chemical known as capsaicin. This may sound quite strange to you, but actually we, you may encounter every day in your, in your life as well, because capsaicin is a pungent compound from chili pepper. So that's from the spicy food. When you we eat uh, uh, chili pepper, you will feel, feel uh, hot in your, in your mouth, right? So uh, this, uh, this kind of sensation is similar to when you accidentally take a uh, hot water. So you'll feel hot and burning in your mouth. So what caused this kind of sensation? So they, they would actually use this in the, in the uh, ingredient from the chili pepper to identify the sensor. In, the, in our nerve system, which penetrates and our skin, which can respond to the chemicals and give our this spicy food sensation. Right. So that that means when, we, although scientists are trying to understand how we sense temperatures, after we the, the discovery of the receptors, now we have relationship to now our probably uh, disease conditions. I see. Like. Now you can see why we can, how we can feel pain. 
in fact, you were working very closely with Adam in his lab when you were working as a postdoctoral uh, degree uh, researcher. Uh, tell me more about how you did your research at that time. What component of your research eventually fit into the overall achievement? And how were you working with Adam during that period of time? Yeah, it actually was very exciting. So now recall the, the period of time. Actually, I, in, I joined the Adam's lab in 2007 yeah. as a postdoc fellow. So when I joined his lab, actually his lab was also working on identifying uh, temperature sensors. So actually David uh, Julius identified the first temp sensor to be one mm -hmm. in 1997. So Adam's lab actually had independently identified several uh, temperature sensors, including uh, the sensor feel, uh, allows it to feel uh, cool mm. like, or cold, tube MA8, and also others. And then in the field, uh, scientists are really keen what molecules allow you to feel pressure. Then Adam's, uh, Adam is also interested in this question. So he had recruited one postdoc from uh, France, it called Bertrand Coast. Like Bertrand had expertise in uh, electrophysiology because it's very difficult to study uh, the mechanical force. So in, uh, in his essay, so he kind of uh, apply for a mechanical force, you will see a very tiny uh, micro pipette to poke the cell. You know, you, if you can imagine you have a, a ball, right? Like yeah. a, a cell, then you poke the cell membrane that give a very tiny force to the cell. If the cell has a sensor, then you can open and this sensor could is an ion channel They allow ions to come into the cell. Then we can use the uh, equipment to record the tiny current. Mm. So that's what Bertrand's expertise. So after he joined uh, uh, Adam's lab, he take the task to try to identify the molecule underlying this, uh, this mechanical evoked currents. Yeah, so then he compared different, he is, first he identified different cell lines, tried to identify those cell lines showing this, kind, this type, of, type of current. And then eventually he had one uh, cell line showing a mechanically activate uh, current. I see. Then he kind of uh, tried to get the expression profile, see what kind of genes are expressed in this uh, cell type. Hmm. And also he's because he's what looking about your for, work? yeah, so my work is just, uh, at that time, I was still working on the uh, temperature sensitive channel. Yeah. Then after uh, uh, Bertrand identified the gene uh, using uh, the technique mm. called PL1 and PL2. So um, then the, the, the discovery was published in 2010 in Science. So when this gene is both necessary and sufficient to mediate this type of current in, when, uh, in, in cells. But from that study, there's an unanswered un question. Well, that question is like this, because this gene encodes a very unique protein. You know protein, right? So cells need protein to uh, do their functions. Mm -hmm. So this protein is quite unique. We know some other ion channels like some channels can sense voltage, some channels can sense chemicals, but these uh, uh, piezo proteins do not resemble any known class of ion channels. Interesting. So this immediately give us one uh, question to answer. So where the piezo protein itself can form an ion channel. So with my expertise, I think, okay, I, whether I could purify this protein, and then we can reconstitute this protein into an artificial cell membrane. Then, and this reduced the uh, uh, system where the piezo protein can mediate currents. Indeed, we found that piezo protein are sufficient to mediate currents by themselves. Right. So based on this evidence, we conclude that piezo protein are the long sought after mechanical activated cation channels. So what is the next goal in terms of research in this direction? I mean, uh, when the Nobel Prize is being awarded to, to 
the two professors, of course, it's a huge recognition of the direction of research. So what's next? I think uh, we need, need, uh, really need to get understand how exactly these uh, molecules, these sensors really can convert the mechanical force into uh, cell signaling. So this, uh, I think, is a very key question. Right now, we still do not have a fully understanding of this. And the second one, whether we could use this sensor or this molecule to develop a uh, drug to treat some related diseases. Mm. Yeah, for example, piezo channel, uh, uh, some patients have mutations in piezo channels, which can cause them to have uh, disease phenotypes. For example, the piezo tube media or gentle touch sensation, and also our proprioception with the, uh, the sense of our own body. So for those patients without PA2 function, they could not touch well, and they also could not work well mm. because they cannot sense their own, their muscle strength, their skeleton position. Interesting. I hope uh, the best luck to you and your team. What is the relationship now, you know, between your research and, you know, of those uh, professors that you've been working with? Is it competition or is it more cooperation or everyone is working on their own way toward the same goal? Yeah, I think now we have a very good relationship uh, with Adam. So we communicate, communicate a, a lot and also about projects. Yeah, so and also we have different uh, emphasis, emphasis on different uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of the study. For example, his lab has uh, worked uh, many on the physiological roles of piezo channels and their disease uh, relationship. And for my lab, we major work on at the molecular level, try to understand how piezo channel really function at the molecular level, allowing them, allowing them to uh, sense force. And also we are trying to, as I just mentioned, trying to uh, screen, uh, chem identify chemicals to, uh, in hope to develop therapeutic therapeutic drugs in the future. There's a lot of discussion, Professor Xiao, in China about, you know, when is a Chinese scientist going to win the Nobel Prize? Of course, it's not the only prize in the world that's important. There are many other prizes that Chinese scientists won. I, I'm hopeful and I'm very encouraged by our current uh, situation in China. So I, I came back to, I, I got my PhD in Canada and uh, did a postdoc in the United States. And then I uh, came back in, in Tsinghua in 2013. Over the last eight, eight years, I really see the uh, research in China has grown so quickly and so, uh, so fast. This is just unbelievable. I think that, uh, with this kind of uh, trend, I, I think uh, we have, uh, we, in the future, we can make lots of major discoveries. Xiao Bailong professor from the School of uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Thank you so much, really appreciate it.